Okay, so this year, um, Daniel is our law speaker. And he's about to give us the presentation about a glimpse into the unpublished words of AA Markov. And before we start, uh, I would like to remind you that please ask questions during the process. Okay? <laughs> and you're asking not, for, not only for yourself, but also for Clive. He's looking forward to that. So, Clive, oh. the master. Okay, you may begin. So, we're going to just have a glimpse. Uh, we're going to dive into the unpublished works of A.A. A. Marco. And so before we start, I, I didn't even know that uh, there were three Marcos. There is A. a. Marco, there is the brother and the son. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't, yeah some, I, don't, I don't remember exactly. But uh, so there were like a lot of hype about like these unpublished works and actually Kevin had to go like all the way to Russia. <laughs> he almost got caught in the airport with these, uh, with the unpublished papers. He, we had to send the, the squad, the, the squad to rescue him. But and now, now after like uh, seeing the, this unpublished work, then uh, we just wanted to like share it with you. So uh, let's see what what we have here. Yes. Who's in the squad? Who what? The who's in the squad? Who's what? In the squad. That's rescuing me. It wasn't so it was actually like, yeah, it was Mateo. <laughs> hey. He actually was like the leader of the mission. Uh, he actually like proposed to like uh, go there swimming, uh, but uh, it was too long, so we didn't. We didn't. Uh, we just like went like straight. You remember, right? Like we're unconscious when we rescue you, but <laughs> but yeah. So it was like uh, it was a like combined effort between Bulgaria, Colombia, <laughs> and Italy, Passport. known as the Big Three Coalition. <laughs> it might be a dream, but I, I don't recall exactly. We were having too much fear when we were resting you. So. Okay, so there is uh, this uh, very important notion that uh, the math finance people are always interested in the Brownian motion, and also the ACO people are also very. Uh, very hyped about it. Uh, and then when you have like a convex object, we can imagine a polytope or something uh, convex, then we can just like let you know the object move granularly, producing the shape. Uh, and the object that we are actually like very going to be like really interested in is uh, but hexagon. So simply known as but hex. <laughs> uh, this, is, this is one of various buts that are very interesting in math. Uh, the prime but that we actually all like is Galois, because as we know, French mathematicians are, have really nice buts. Like, Antoine is one of the... <laughs> We're not going to enter this discussion because I think uh, he knows it, so we don't need to like remember it. Sure, and... Um, <laughs> This Brownian motion comes in the form of this butt hex. <laughs> and it's really key that we can embed different kinds of objects into this butt. <laughs> uh, and well, Markov, I think like this is the, the story, like I, I'm not, you know, making a lot of noise about it, but actually he, he, he actually produced this work when he was in Greece, uh, following one of his girlfriends. So he was actually just interested in butts all the time. <laughs> and yeah, for some reason he got like interested in, um, in these embeddings of butts. So, so now let's mix a little bit of these uh, embeddings and uh, what we know about Brownian motion. So everybody knows that uh, Brownian motion has no explosion in the sense that, um, that it goes either one by one or, you know, like in the limit of the continuous is just the discrete approximation. So it doesn't explode. That's something that we know. Um, but sometimes it is possible that the Brownian motion explodes after it's being embedded. Wait, sometimes it's possible to show embedded time first. Yeah, so you embed the Brownian motion and then it, for some reason it explodes. Uh, maybe this embedding has not very nice properties. 
Um, and this was responded by uh, this uh, German guy that didn't know how to spell his name. <laughs> if he had been uh, like actual uh, literate guy, would have known that his name is SCH. But for some reason, he put his name in all these papers, and now we have. Uh, his misspelled name, the ship the pilot. <laughs> uh, I'm just gonna say it really fast because uh, people might be interpreting this like uh, the way that should be. <laughs> the only the only interest is the butt is not the ship. So <laughs> right. <laughs> this, is the, this is the time that when we were writing with, with Kevin, we didn't understand exactly what Marco was saying. I think he was a little bit drunk because the paradox doesn't, if, if it happens, no, the paradox is always there. But uh, because of the paradox, then you're said to shit, but. <laughs> Marco was uh, thinking about proving like all, all these theorems, but um, he wasn't actually able to prove anything. But Mick Jagger, drinking ones like Jagger Master, I think, uh, with David Bowie, he actually managed to prove the theorem that Marco was actually after all the time, uh, and it's called the Marco Jagger Bowie theorem. Uh, and it says basically that if you're in a binary Case because it's from uh, Vienna, right? It's the Wiener uh, space. It's too small, or very much it pulls out of the buttex too fast, then you lose a bit of your embedding. So that basically means that when you have a complex object in which you have your brownian motion, if you pull it too fast, it might explode. And that's exactly the case in which brownian motion embeddings can explode. Do you have a rate? Or like you can yeah, the rate of convergence is actually like this is something that we tried with Jacob to understand because there's no, there's no set theoretical background or framework in which you actually can say how fast it is. It would be something of like one over zero equals one. It's something really fast. It's just you don't even know that. That's why it's called explosion. This really this reminds me of something you've been working on like by yourself. He's like I think I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about that more in detail in my next <laughs> Friday <laughs> if you're interested. In but yeah, I think like this is the, the thing that has eluded mathematicians, especially set theorists, for a long time is when a brownian motion explodes, how fast does it do it? Because it's sort of like the rate for any rate it, it is actually faster than that. So it's sort of like that's why we call it like one over zero plus one because it's so close to inconsistent that that we, we still don't know we still don't have the the, the framework but uh, we're working on it. Uh, but yeah, this is this is a big deal in my current research. Uh, we will see like if actually like there's an implosion happening, but we, we haven't been able to figure out that. So for now, we're just gonna deal with the explosion. Uh, okay. Do you have numerical animation? That no, no, it's, it's so fast that when you, that we tried to code in Python, but then Jacob's computer exploded, we have to buy a new one. <laughs> it is just, I don't know, like, but, uh, it's really, it's really puzzling, because at some point you're thinking, like, this is just a mathematical, you know, object, and for some reason, you know, like, it shouldn't interfere with your computer, but for some reason, I, we're seeing, like, black magic happening there. I, I don't know if, if, I don't know, Python knows about it. Uh, yeah, the computer exploded. Like a brownian motion, so we don't know. Uh, yeah, I'm not gonna be very anal about it, so we're gonna go into the details. Um, basically, it just goes so fast to prove that you don't even know why it's true. So it explodes, so it's just not feasible to go over this. Um, <laughs> yeah, this is something that uh, we were talking this morning with uh, Adrian and. We were thinking that we were like fairly sure about like math being independent of space and time, but um, then I was thinking if, if you were like in El Paso or somewhere in the Middle East, if you would be able to prove this theorem, and apparently that there is just like 
is not possible. Like I told a friend that he's in Texas, I said it here, but he wasn't able to. So it's a legal issue, I think, I don't know, it's just, keep, it's just not happening. Uh, but so far, we know that if you're not in Texas or in the Middle East, this explosion is happening and it's always when you pull up out of the uh, <laughs> yeah, speaking of David Bowie, I think like, people don't know much about him. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but uh, he actually had like this gigantic work in math and material science. Uh, I don't know like how many of you like actually knew his work. Not many, right? Like, is it, is it, is I only got into it after he died. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> this is a very interesting question that not many people, uh, the thing is that I'm arachnophobic, so I don't, I don't like to look at this uh, question, but you know, basically you wonder how many spiders, if you were in Mars and you're in an n-dimensional space. What's an n-dimensional spider? No, I think these, these spiders have, are dimensionless. They're just like... <laughs> <laughs> this is like, this is an interesting question. Like, how do you capture them, right? They're not Pokemon. <laughs> it's not... It has, it, has, it has been like really like difficult to actually like make like the actual question make sense. But if you're in Mars, and then you have some spiders, and you manage to capture one, how, we don't know, how many can be packed into a unit sphere? So this is an easy question for Pokemon because you can pack as many as you want, you know, like you see. <laughs> <laughs> but spiders, spiders are so much more difficult. And, well, David was really interested. Dave was really interested. <laughs> <laughs> I was talking once one day and, and, he, and I was like, you know, like I'm a homophobic, I, I don't want to deal with spiders. Like, chipmunks, we know how many chipmunks they fit. Three. Three if they're female, four if they're male, nobody knows why. <laughs> What's the quick proof of that? The quick proof of that? Yeah. You go to Shelly Park. <laughs> you have your rocket ready. Right, because they have to be from Mars. Oh, we're talking about chipmunks in Mars? Yeah, chipmunks, yeah. If in Mars or in there? In the Earth, it just can't be two. <laughs> you think about it. You just go to Shelly Park. You know my friend Pablo? <laughs> Pablo is this guy that studies in material science. Talking about, we were talking about Dave. And then we're at Shelly Park. And then we have like these unit bugs. Uh, and what you do is you go to Shelly Park, you put the unit box, and you put cheese. <laughs> you wait for two hours, and then you're going to have two chipmunks. How do you know that there's no third chipmunk that fits? Uh, we actually tried it. We put a third one, and uh, he got killed by the other two. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's how I feel. And uh, so my friend Pablo and me, like we we tried with raccoons, but today the first raccoon in was like almost impossible. Um, he like the raccoon ripped one of his fingers out. So I'll be, sorry, I, I missed number two. How do materials absorb energy while under pressure? Um, I think um, this is a question that has to do with not only mathematicians and material scientists, but everyone. Uh, you guys, when you're under pressure, how do you absorb energy, right? Like, you have many examples, you're so under pressure, uh, how do you absorb energy? I, sometimes I feel that I cannot absorb energy, but um, we, don't know, we don't know many answers for this. Uh, and what are the properties of the scary monster group? Um, the scary monster group is a group of uh, 56 elements, right? Is it 56? How many numbers? It's scary. More, more than that. The scary monster group. 10, 10 to the 17. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> that's it. That's it. That's it. That's Yeah, I thought it was 56. Yeah, yeah it's 10 to the 17. Within a few orders of magnitude. Yeah, that's, it's really irrelevant. It's, it's just that it's a different number. That's what it's actually. Like. Not, all, not all monsters are scary. So it's going to be smaller than the monster group for sure. No, because if it's a scary monster, it needs to be bigger. Unless, <laughs> 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 okay, this is the thing, like, it depends on, like, you know, like, where you are, because a scary monster needs to be, like, really big. <coughs> it cannot be smaller than 10 to the 17. Is, is that a proven theorem? This is a conjecture. Oh. But this is, we have, like, a lot of, like, intuition why this should be true. At least Roy has. Like, he works in extreme things, like, 
from your turks and scary monsters. Like, Do you know how these scary monsters can be packed under the unit bag? <laughs> the unit bag. <laughs> <laughs> so this is uh, Mike Wasowski. Is that does that count as a scary monster? <laughs> Mike Wasowski fits there, and uh, I think uh, it's really hard to to answer the question because you need like one of these special doors to go. <laughs> But at least one. At least one. <laughs> <laughs> and, and thank you, of course. Like, we wonder you're chatting in you, you know, like, Colombia. Um, <laughs> so you start asking the question about uh, Cokes. And um, this is a person that we don't know, and he probably didn't know. Uh, we don't want to experiment with that because uh, people get too hyped about it. Uh, well, you can bootstrap the argument. I think in Italy we have a conjecture. Yes. And when you're under pressure, you can absorb more. <laughs> and so you can loop through and like go all the way to. Oh, yeah. So this is, this is like actually like a, a thing that gets, you know, like two and four are related in the sense that when you're under pressure, you tend to go for some little help from four and maybe push some energy out of it. Uh, but, okay, let's talk about scary monsters because that's the object of interest. After talking about ground motion, like you know, like that's pretty much understood. So, <laughs> <laughs> and move on to the scary monster theorem. Um, yeah, so the scary monster group has no relation to the friendly monster group like that. Just by definition, right? Like scary monsters have nothing to do with uh, the friendly monster group. And the friendly monster group is the monster group of Fisher guys. Um, I think he's. Uh, Fisher was friends also with this guy called Price. <laughs> and, uh, but they didn't label the group as Fisher Price because then uh, little kids would be too hyped about it. So, but anyway, uh, that, that's very friendly. But we're interested in the, in the scary. Uh, so we're going to start by now going into math and formalizing the notion of how scary something is or, or scary is in general. So a group is not at all scary, abbreviated NAS, <laughs> if it appears on Wolfram Alpha. <laughs> but it can appear on Wolfram Alpha, you, you might not know if it appears because you need uh, the monthly su subscription for the service ISP. So if it's on Wolfram Alpha, it's not scary. right? And that's why you can check uh, where the monster group has to be big or small, like if you type small, then it's it appears in Wolfram Alpha, if you think that he gives some suggestion, he gets confused about it. Um, <laughs> and then you supply double negation, right? Double negation, not, not in math world, is positive, right? So a group is scary if it's not, not at all scary. Uh, this doesn't reflect the, the intuition of real life, right? Not, not doesn't mean it is, but uh, in math we can just do this. Um, <coughs> a group is creepy, which is a different notion of uh, scariness, it's a little bit more. So creepy entails scary, so a group is creepy if it's scary, uh, but Stefan Wolfram knows it's scary. So it's not only a group, it's, it's not only scary, but Stefan Wolfram knows that it's scary. That's a creepy group. Uh, and we usually represent creepy groups by the pseudo letter <laughs> right. This is not an eye, this is not a Oyota with like a, it's just like you look, this is the two eyes, this is the eyebrows, and this is the nose. This is, if you say like this is a group, it's like. <laughs> yes? So is this letter silent? Is it like what? Silent, this letter? Like when you pronounce it, you pronounce it silent, now it's just a face. Yeah, it's silent, it's clean silent. It's uh, just expressional, what they call expre expressional letters. Just, uh, Sorry, what was that again? Expressional? No, can you tell me the letter again? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not good. <laughs> yeah, it's, it was very inconvenient. Uh, people always laugh when you're doing talks about these kind of like creepy. Uh, groups, but um, it's just it's very it, it's it's a it's a way of denoting uh, the creepy groups with a creepy face. So I feel like it just it makes a really good. Daniel, yeah. isn't every scary group creepy? Because Stephen Wolfram could just type into Wolfram Alpha whether this group is no, no. This is scary. not Stephen. This is Stefan. 
This is Stefan. Stefan is the younger brother. He cannot die. He's two, three years old. How can he? That's the main difference. That's exactly the main difference between Stefan and Stefan. <laughs> this is so weird because one is, I think, uh, he's American. The brother is German for some reason. <laughs> I put the same name, but they just know the pronunciation. And he never subscribed. Huh? He never subscribed. No, he never subscribed. That's exactly what they have the issue. Here. He cannot even type. He cannot even. Subscribe. But it's a really good, you know, like it's a really good definition. You know that something is creepy if he knows it's scary. It's just there's no question about it. You go, you call Stefan. You know about this group. <laughs> that's the only. That's the only way we can verify whether a group is is, is creepy. Um, Stefan has blonde hair. And, uh, blonde? Blonde, he's blonde. Oh. I don't know if that says anything, but it's just not uh, So yeah, let's continue with the scary monster theorem. So now we know that what a, when a group is scary and is creepy, if Stefan knows um, it's scary, so it's more than scary. Uh, and monsters are groups. Uh, because we already knew that, right? Like mon monster groups, because we're talking about monster groups. So part of being a monster is being a group, and whose actions annihilate cats. For example, Cat Stevens, Cat Stevens died after he was uh, put <laughs> under an action of uh, one of Dave's groups. Uh, and the scary monster theory basically says like clowns are scary monsters. Like I don't still don't understand why they bring clowns to like kids' little kids' parties. <coughs> Wait, this was proven by Scary Monster? <laughs> 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 no, 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 this is a uh, theorem Scary Monster, I don't know, I, this is a big type, I was preparing the slides and, um, no, it should be theorem. Theorem of the Scary Monster. Yeah. Or, scary, scary Monster, so far, we don't know, like, anyone that does not present. But there's so many differences, capitalize the latter, so maybe the main difference. No, no, I think I was thinking in German, so I capitalized it. So yeah, so the theorem is that clowns are scary monsters. Like, if you if you really think like kids actually develop the the sense of scariness looking at clowns in parties, like you see like one guy like dressed as a, as a clown, you run for your life. Right? That's exactly what happens. And the proof we're just gonna look is it is a rough sketch. It's not the actual proof. But uh, I guess I, I, we're just going to give like the intuition here. So we saw like when we were undergrads, the clowns are just uh, some funny limits of pseudo letter diagrams, like <coughs> the pseudo letter we had, like the expressional letter we had before, denoting the creepy. Which pseudo letter? Can you remind us? The letter? <laughs> uh, I, yeah, let me think about it. I need to see. It. It's, it's so hard to really like. Oh, yeah, it's. <laughs> <laughs> you, need to watch, you need to actually see it once you do it. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise. So let's go back to the proof. Uh, so Sharon is here. She's an undergrad. Uh, which semester do you see this? Uh, is, it, is it sophomore year that we learned this? It's first day. For, first day of yeah. sophomore year. Yeah. Oh, first day of freshman year. No, freshman year, I think I learned that doing basic things in concept and then we go to scary stuff. Before we do the little fluffy. The floor is the TA and professor. We are second year teaching his stuff. A funny limit of serial letter diagrams, it might be hard to get it. So let us consider uh the limit. Let's go back to the proof. Let's not uh, the limits look on the right hand on the left hand side they look like uh, the American map with some just randomly <laughs> generated dots. Uh, that's why it's a funny limit is because it's a representation of a funny country. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, it actually converges to uh, something here. I don't recall exactly what the shape is uh, but it actually converges to this uh, right hand side here. Uh, I forgot what well, exactly the, the shape of that is, but anyway, let's so just continue the proof. We'll see itself. Explain, explain. There you go. 
Uh, <laughs> yes, and after a little bit of transformation, then exactly what I was saying is this is clearly just a dog. <laughs> <laughs> and if you can actually verify this, is because in America everyone knows dogs. Like, we love dogs here. So, but it's a little bit rotated. So, but that doesn't that doesn't say anything to that. Um, the limit, of course, when something is rotated, we call it cough. So when you're cough standing up, you're just like doing a handstand. So this is just a cough dog because it's a dog rotated 180. That's what it is. Um, and dogs are cough cats. Uh, the only dog that is, uh, so right, this one dog that is cat at the same time is cat dog. That's the only one that is called cock cat. Is the same one. But in general, in general, a cock cat is just a, a dog, and a dog is a cock cat. So, so is cat dog an injective object in this category? Uh, cat dog is, uh, you can think of it, I haven't, I haven't think about it, but no. it makes sense, yes, it's a cat dog. We need to call Nickelodeon to verify that fact. Uh, I was talking the other day with one of their leading uh, category theorists, but I never, I never asked the question. Uh, yeah, so then dogs are clearly monsters because uh, they are cocaine. Okay. <coughs> Is cocaine originated from that definition? Yeah, cane. <laughs> That's exactly what it is. Like if, you, if, you, if, you go, if you go to Colombia and you look at the sugar cane, the cane, right? You write it say, and voila. <laughs> right, we, should, we, shouldn't say, we shouldn't say that loud because then we're going to get, you know. This is just between us, right? <laughs> They're going to come like the FBI. Like <laughs> the math department is here, they're doing code. <laughs> Talking about Pokemon and Digimon, then uh, we're going to go. Uh, and see some examples of clowns as monsters. Uh, there is uh, Mr. Mime, one of uh, the Ashes Mom's housekeepers, right? That's Mr. Mime, that's the famous Pokemon who was Ashes' first monster Pokemon. Um, and then there's also, I forgot the name of the Spider-Man. Who? Spider-Man. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Uh, the difference between Digimon and Pokemon is uh, nothing but the, the, the unit box, right? So in the Pokemon world, we have the unit box that is a sphere. In the Digimon world, it's like more like a you know, Manhattan distance kind of thing. Like, <laughs> but, it, but it's the same. Like If you do a map, it's completely homeomorphic. Uh, if you look at Misty, there has like a correspondent in, in Digimon Ash. Clearly, there's one of these Digimon trainers there. So, but these are just examples. So you just to get a feel of what a monster is. Uh, are there any questions about the Pokemon or the Digimons? I don't remember if you're going to ask me what's the number 255 Pokemon. I don't remember. But maybe other questions. Are there any questions? How does Saruman fit? Saruman? <laughs> well, Saruman is a completely different dimension because Saruman. Um, so Saruman is a, as Pokemon as um, you know. Ned Stark is to Tony Stark. So they're sort of the same category, but sort of distant away. Um, is that a Manhattan distance, or what sort of distance are you using there? Uh, that's just the ratings of television, uh, in, uh, in, the, in the comparison between the stars, right? Because one is just uh, George R. 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 How many R's? <laughs> and then the Tony Stark is just Mark. So, you just compare the ratings and then you take the absolute value. So that's just like the Euclidean distance on the rating. So you first have to map the start to its TV show and then just, for example, Arya Stark, this is, this is not even a metric fit because Arya Stark's distance to Sansa Stark is zero. Yet there are different people. It's, it's, a pseudo, it's not exactly, a but it's fine. You know, like Sansa, Arya Stark, it's sort of the same drum. <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> what, were you, what was the question? <laughs> Saruman, Saruman, Saruman is, um, he had a full army of uh, monsters at some point, uh, of the uh, And I think the number of, of works you have uh, grows proportionally on your wideness. That's why uh, when you actually start like, doing more works, like, it became wider and wider. Uh, I don't know, like maybe in Iceland they have like, a lot of monsters. They're really wide. 
I have the act, but the acting sermon was from I, uh, from Iceland. But he actually changed his clip to Rainbow as he got more uh, okay. more works. Who? <laughs> <laughs> I just 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 a comment on Simon. <laughs> Are you already okay? <laughs> <laughs> I know well. I know a lot about Simon. That's all I'm saying. Oh. Okay. Um, <coughs> Century Fox 31st, that's uh, the other version of uh, the other Fox 21st century. Uh, so let's go back to, to the cats. And, and they have, so again, uh, dogs are monsters, because they're cockats. And cats have representations as uh, Libru. Uh, sloth, liar, aka flesh. <laughs> uh, if cats form a group and further <laughs> agree with the differentiable structure induced by funnel limits, the local charts are called artful cut. Huh? Cut. <laughs> There's a difference between cat map. Because a cat map is just a map between two cats. So between two co dogs. <laughs> a co map between cats. Um, but a cat map is not a co map because it goes that direction. So that's it. We need two different because Otherwise, we might get lost in the groups. But um, we're going to define it in, in, in the next slide. Uh, at this point, I deny that we're just having too much trouble trying to feed. So I just put pauses everywhere. <laughs> So we, are, we, we can say more about cats and use it to prove the Harry the Harry Potter theorem. This was a theorem that I tried to explain to my cousins and didn't understand very well. Like, because you cannot, this is the theorem that you cannot, uh, how do you say, roomable without like having like a rotational or like a, uh, But we're just going to see a proof uh, very easy of this Harry Potter theorem uh, using just cats. Products, co limits, co functions, and cat maps. And cat maps. <laughs> uh, so we call them all monsters and inlaid all cats. This is uh, the principle of Valar Morfulis. And this is really bad Valyrian. For some reason, uh, <laughs> I think it's Valyrian. Is it Valyrian? I don't remember. You remember, right? That you were capturing in Moscow and then they took you to uh, Valyrian. <laughs> it is Valyrian. Right? Yeah, I recall some that. Yeah. They, like, the they have different accents, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Were you able to meet one of the drones? Well, actually, uh, I fly, I fly back to America. Oh, you fly, no, but it, you, no, you're not dreaming because my tail's not. Oh, no, you're dream, right? Oh, my drone, right? Uh, well, Valerians don't like very much cats, so the principle says that all cats must die. Uh, so, Monsters induce killing fields on lead groups of a cat. Or groups of cats lying or lying cats. Uh, which is uh, <laughs> it's a very, it's a very special uh, kind of field found by uh, this uh, Norwegian guy called Gar. So these kind of uh, fields are called Garfield. <laughs> which is always like. Like that's exactly. It's also orange. That's something else. Really. No. Uh, but the flows of killing fields uh, they preserve measures, of course. <laughs> so by just by definition, that's. <laughs> if you're going to require one property of flows of killing fields, it's that they have to preserve measures. Not number of lives. Measure. <laughs> and measures. Invariant on the group fractions are par measures. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so that that's that should be clear. <laughs> I forgot to put the QED for this. But it's <laughs> so, so Garfield is a soft kitty. And a soft kitty is usually a warm kitty. 
It's obvious that it doesn't require proof. Like this is it's just common sense. <laughs> and well, now we can just uh, apply the very handy big fan theorem. Uh, a subkit is then a little ball of four. In actually, we don't need like the big fan theorem. You just need to have a soft kitty, just caress him, and then you're going to have a little ball of four. You're just going to notice that again. <laughs> uh, which is exactly as a hairy ball, and vice versa. But from little ball of four, you cannot go back to little one k. Like you cannot do something like that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, I, I have one of these like uh, these kitties, but not that large. <laughs> it's a little ball of four, but it's not a. <laughs> and well, <laughs> hairy balls. Then you have. Happy kitty, sleepy kitty, poor poor. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the most transparent proof that we found in, in the book. This was uh, I saw it. I couldn't sleep because I was so delighted of the clarity of the of the proof that it's just I don't even I we can just say this obvious pretty much at this point. Uh, you just have to follow the definition of the kitties and the kittens, and you're gonna be fine. Uh, this is the, the professor's love. But this is not very accurate. I think uh, he doesn't wear that much. But is he moving? Huh? Is he moving? <laughs> is he not? Is Jeep? Is that Jeep? And then I'm not sure if he's moving or not. But <laughs> moving, moving. I think he's moving really fast for the uh, for the average <laughs> Do, do not confuse with Professor Slack, that's it. <laughs> He's uh, a is here today. Uh, Ryan Reynolds, in a very funny cousin. Uh, so, let's just talk about the Kappa now, because we already talked about too much about the living uh, and stuff. So, cat maps are just, uh, <laughs> are just maps between cats. Uh, and if you actually like look close, there is uh, the word cat here. <laughs> and there's the word map here. We have uh, these two eyes cancel because this one has a check and this one has a hat. <laughs> so, it's exactly, it's a perfect cat map. Uh, <laughs> So C A T M A and P, we use them for local uh, cats. Um, but then researchers just uh, just wanted to choose names for the cats uh, and just be able to introduce any name between the maps of the cats. They, you know, researchers always want to have like the last word in how to name things. Uh, I think like there's one thing on top of the bucket. Uh, so there's a naming convention between these uh, maps that distinguishes between uh, newbies and established uh, researchers. Uh, so if you're going to build a CAD diagram, then if you want to you know, make sure that they don't treat you as a newbie, then you should follow the standards and the conventions for naming these uh, variables here. Uh, see, that's exactly the A's that I was pointing out before. Uh, the upper left corner uh, should be an A with a hat, uh, and not the the lower right corner. <laughs> uh, this, in this case, we have uh, both. So we are like sort of a new B established yes, agent. I think that the A with a little check on it is a reference. Oh, this one? <laughs> the, the check one or the hat one? Uh, the, the the check one, I think. The Just check one. Look at that little. One. The check one? No, no, no. This one, this one is ah. Uh, this one you just have to like put your eyebrows like this and say ah. Uh. <laughs> this is a problem all the time with like uh, these uh, you know, kind of letters with uh, sort of like some kind of like gestures attached to them. But yeah, just ah. Uh. <laughs> the other one is ah. <laughs> yes. Um, I think two questions. Yes. So the first one, right? Yeah. The cross there, I'm not sure. Should that be a cross or a hat? Where is th this cross here? 
No, what's that? Oh. I have to follow tail. <laughs> oh no, that's just for in the, it's a cockat because he's flipped. That one is a dog actually. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think he's asking about the axe in the Yeah, so so we put we put an axe when it's a co or object. Right. Does this have sure. butts? <laughs> uh, no, this is, this is the butt quadrilateral. I uh, really don't see this X. If you can, like, point to it. There's a cat. The point is, this is exactly the thing of the explosion. You don't want to go too far. <laughs> <laughs> then we cannot have, like, we cannot continue the. The presentation of the slides, um, it would be a shame because this is a shame person not to. Yeah, but that one, see, this one is a cat. This one is a cock cat. This is a dog. <laughs> and the one horizontal is the lion cat. Yeah, this is almost Garfield. <laughs> <laughs> so if you, if you randomly pick the cat of this end of the diagram, almost surely it's Garfield. This one is not, because it's uh, not completely orange. But I don't know if it's Garfield. It doesn't look like Garfield. But, okay, so this is. Uh, what we have to say about the cat diagram. So, an actual generalization of the maps, that one is a C. It's not like C because it has the maps. <laughs> uh, the map C, A, and T is the Soishan, because the guy in general is transformed, introduced in uh, 1957. This is the same year that. Uh, Dave was wondering about these diagrams and stuff. Um, so the transformation is uh, just a cat transformation that goes, and cat here doesn't stand for, for cat or anything, it's just a category. It's for, from thing one to thing number two, this is just uh, this, So we have to distinguish between cat, the hairy fluffy balls, and the category transformation. Uh, so for the inverse transform, uh, it's a little bit more more convoluted, but uh, they were worked out in the next year. The cat comes back, but th this one is the cat cat. This is the cat dog that comes back and goes from A to B to C, goes all the way to the whole alphabet, and it ends in boom. Fom, foom, fom. Sorry, this is German. Fom. <laughs> and well, the techniques. Uh, inspired by this work, we're applying our areas of research and quickly created the following two colors. Uh, the color is Sois, which means C use in German. Uh, this is one is proportional to two, proportional to Garfield after eating a lot, which is proportional to uh, the blue square. If you're seeing it green, it's because of the daltonic, but this is blue. This is green, though. Uh, and the second color only is also to use Sois. And it's uh, X and M. <laughs> Not M and M. It's X and M. Great. M and M is this candy. Great. So are there any questions about these cats, other cat categories, co-cats, dogs, cut dogs, hot dogs, and cat dogs? <laughs> Son? What's X and M? X and M? X and M, uh, this is the variable that denotes the universe of all cats. And this is the universe of all monsters. So it says that there is at least one cat that is a monster. So yeah, I'm missing this is uh, this is not equal empty set. So there's at least there exists a limit. Uh, Excuse me. Chris, yes. Do you like them, M? Do I like who? The X and M. <laughs> yeah, X and M. Yeah, I like it. <laughs> I, mean, I have one for you. Would you prefer a green a X and M? Sam, I am. Can I prove that corollary on a plane? Can I prove it on a train? <laughs> How about oh, yeah, we're, we're actually, we're, we're actually, uh, we're out in Texas. No, 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 there you are, no, in Texas. Texas. <laughs> no, in, te in Texas, nothing of this discussion, like, if we were in Texas, uh, X&M is really frowning. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
And we were in Texas, we wouldn't even be able to have these discussions. <laughs> like this is out of the question. This is not even true in Texas. I don't even think in Tennessee. <laughs> but certainly from North Carolina and above, we uh, Excellent. Yeah. Uh, just out of curiosity, um, this researcher Seuss, I'm not familiar with him. How exactly would you address him? Uh, <laughs> he doesn't like doctor. <laughs> <laughs> he thinks that doctor is making him look old. Uh, just call her Harriet. I think it's Harriet. <laughs> uh, yeah. Harriet would be. Send her the email to the to the hotmail account, not to the, the research account, she's not going to reply. She might, yeah, reply. Uh, Debbie? Uh, just a foundational question, like concerning your capitalization here. Uh, Which so capitalization? Uh, like the things, they're written in capital letters. Yes. Uh, is it so that I thought that your cats here were small, but are they, as the French say, gross? <laughs> <laughs> As in, are there, are they, do they have a cardinality larger than a universe? Yeah, yeah, here we're working. Like okay, so we're these working are gross cats, no, no, all of them. No, but then I was thinking of how you would do the butt hex embedding without them being getting gross. No, yeah, no, like, <laughs> since, since we started talking about this, we left CFC a long time ago. Uh, yeah, all, the, all, all these theories, like, maybe, uh, two levels above. I think it's like third order over CFC. Just a uh, super compact would make it this okay. consistent. So it's not. It's not. Yeah, cat is at least like the the height of the ordinals. But we just do not do it small because if you look from above, it's just like a small peak. It's not too bad. Although it's just a category. So, uh, <coughs> so there's some immediate consequences or properties of the Soitian transform. Uh, so uh, they're very useful properties, but uh, those proofs are just uh, very mathematical. So uh, we're just doing them as an exercise. For the ones that don't know logic, then you can ask me pay with the issue in the room, which will most of you check it. So. <laughs> uh, so <coughs> Brennings and Hamlet, this is the source. So on boxability, let's go back to the box. You had any cube, any cube Q, repeated application of cat will eventually brief Q. So this this applies to all the cats except Schrodinger's cat. <laughs> because the guy will never leave the box. <laughs> don't even know if it's dead or alive, so. But. And we also have uh, the anti-foxity. So the null space of cat is spanned by the characteristic functions of so-called fox sets. Uh, sorry for this, somebody, <laughs> I forgot to use later. <laughs> uh, so, so the characteristic functions uh, of the fox sets uh, just span the null space of cat. Um, and that's easy to see, right? Like if you take a picture of fox and you erase all the color and just leave the, sh the shades, you're going to believe that it's a cat. The identity is the distribution transform of the sum distribution. <laughs> your, your sum, you can't copy this, is S itself. Right? You, you don't get moved by the transform. You always, I mean, moving you is almost impossible. Have you ever tried in life? Uh, yeah. Your sum, sum you are. These, of course, like are not surely. This is almost surely just in the distribution of sense, or I don't know if the other distribution of sense that people have in common. Uh, we didn't go into that detail. Uh, then there's a, a theorem. There exists the families of fox sets of unbounded cardinality. This is a easy just compactness argument of more theory. Just have like this go up. So. There is this historical note that I want to mention is a local structure for uh, the mention of Q being bigger, bigger equal to 5 was known uh, for Hammett uh, when he started his work in 1989. And 
and he puzzled and puzzled until the puzzler was sore. Um, <laughs> but then uh, <laughs> he thought something that he hadn't thought before. Yeah, I, you know, remember these thoughts are difficult <coughs> to get. And George Bush even said that there are thoughts that are very difficult to unthink or unthink. I don't remember how he was. But anyways, uh, this is the proof. Now, and this just mainly the idea. I'm not going to go into it. Just like getting proofs of kinetics or something. Just so maybe John said that's what he thought. Maybe, maybe. Cannot just before. <coughs> this before is before, not be before. It's before in the past. Uh, can they mention perhaps be a little bit more? So you have to say many times until it rhymes, and then you're fine. Maybe you <laughs> said, you thought, cannot just before. Can they mention perhaps be a little bit more? And it rhymes, so you can go ahead. <laughs> as well as anti -fox city, fox city, the main tool stems from the following definition. We say a distribution, I'm talking about the Schrodinger. Uh, we say that a distribution is Schrodinger if it's a uniform limit of iterations of cat. <coughs> of some initial distribution S, uh, here S stands for any distribution, not just some. But if you iterate him enough, then you can resemble any iteration you want. So it's, it, you can always start with some, that's fine. Uh, it is a fatal, fatal exercise to show that the property of being Schrodinger satisfies a C1 law because you, right, you make the cat. But it'll still be a little ball of fur, right? Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's exactly why the implication doesn't go backwards. That's a very nice example, that's really good. That might tell, yeah, Adrian. All right, just to be, to be sure, after working on, um, yeah. on this, what, what do you call it, Brownian motion with, uh, with the bug sets? Or yes. Yeah, um, couldn't that make your puzzler sore also? <laughs> <laughs> it depends on how much uh, motion. <laughs> but, um, so there's there's the thing, right? Like you have the the box. <laughs> so here's the the X. The, there's there's the cat here. <laughs> It's gonna hurt if you don't apply a substantial amount of um, moisturizer in that area. But otherwise, it's not gonna. It's not gonna. It looks like an. But you know, like there's a cat. I don't know. Is it better cat? Yeah, like that. Sorry. <laughs> that's okay. So, but it's the, the point that should be. That's not too important now. Like if you hurt, it doesn't. Uh, but you cannot experiment with the showing your cut because it could be fatal. But if you just want to, you know, ball of fur, then it's fine. You can do it. Uh, and, uh, well, the first thing we're going to do is, of course, check that the definition makes sense. And, well, we're just going to get a uniform limit of iteration of any function f and by some standard basic algebraic theory, uh, this gives a constant function g, where g uh, is identically natural f d l n. In our case, f is just a cat, right? so we can just replace, uh, and we get uh, g equals cat, natural cat, so we're averaging out the cat. Right. So, for example, if you put here like the Schrodinger cat, you have half a cat. Because, you know, uh, but this is just by Fourier, just a cat evaluated at zero. Uh, therefore, uh, what a Schrodinger distribution does is exactly what a capricious cat does at the origin. So that's exactly what it is. Just you look at the origin, you evaluate the cat. What, what is a capricious cat? Capricious cat is one that is a monster. Do you remember accident? <laughs> so there's this is these cats, monsters. Capricious cat is one that is actually creepy. <laughs> so you, you call Stefan. Uh, yeah, uh, 
have this cat. <laughs> this cat's scary. <laughs> like, sure, that's a capricious cat. <laughs> so for knowing the whole value of this thing, you just need to take this cat and just evaluate it at zero. We have to figure out how to evaluate a cat at zero. <laughs> but if the theory works, then it's going to give you all the information about uh, about the distribution. So then we have uh, well, so Schrodinger was Austrian, right? Uh, Edmund Schrodinger was Austrian. Uh, his middle name was Seh. Uh, but that's important. Uh, Oh, no, sorry. This is the brother of uh, Edmund Schrodinger was Sehaib or Sehaib Schrodinger. Uh, he actually loved cats. And he never let his brother take his cat for putting it in the box. <laughs> he didn't want to, but your brother is what would have happened to a cat if they wanted to. But okay. So then after, after you know, like, realizing that the only thing you need to know for getting the showing the distribution of cats is what this obnoxious cat, or how I used to call it, um, <laughs> this capricious cat does at zero, or obnoxious cat is at zero, then he was interested in, in different things. Uh, so Linus, who, Ulin, uh, you have to pause, who, Uli. You cannot say Ulin because nobody's going to understand. Uh, from the theorem that, uh, this operator that goes from S, S is Sam. <laughs> <laughs> so you go from the distribution of Sam, so for example, you take this Sam, and you map them to real numbers. So you take Sam, and you average it out. So in this case, if you have like here the Sam that is the cat, this is just the capricious cat, the capricious cat at zero. That's what this uh, operator is doing. Uh, so he proved that this operator, this is actually surprising. If you think, if you look at the formula, there's no way you can look and say, of course it's objective. It looks like everything goes just to one point, right? You just cat value at zero. But actually, surprisingly, it actually goes through all the ranges of the real number. That means that you have like a lot of capricious cats. There's uncountable many cats. Because you have <laughs> uncountable many real numbers, and each, right, like if you put here, this is just cat value at zero, depending on which cat it is. So you have a lot of cats. So you have a lot of conduct, conduct. <laughs> uh, and here also, besides being Sam, S is just the Schwarz space, which is the black space, which is the black hole, because it's black. Schwarz in German is black. Uh, but the proof is omitted. This is just a trivial application of multiple <coughs> uh, via forcing techniques in all the senses. So you basically take forcing is just Forcing, right? You take multi and just force it in, so <laughs> you get the theorem done. That's, if you don't know what, for, right, JC? That's pretty much what forcing is, right? That's why he started working on it, just do the forcing. Uh, but, yeah. So this is just like the, this is what you should do. You go to multi and you force everything, you're done. And then you have the definition of the accumulus class of F. At R is just the elements of this black space, the Schwartz space. Uh, that they get mapped to R. So <coughs> this is equivalent to just the class of cats that get evaluated. When you evaluate them at zero, then you get back R. So we might go to the shelter and see like how many cats we can evaluate and have some description of what this is. Uh, and then we have the space, the poo, pooling space. It's just all the equivalent kinds of these ones. So basically, you have like at this point, like you have a pet shop. You have cats everywhere in different boxes depending on what they give when you evaluate zero. We still don't know if evaluating a cat at different times can give you different outputs, but it's possible. But for actually doing the exercise, we need to put them in a box and we don't want to jeopardize any cats. So we still do that. Any question about uh, this operator, forcing? <laughs> There's no questions. I think, uh, yeah, it's, it's, all, it, it's just clear, right? It's surprising, but it's just what it needs to be. It's like the, fir the first time you see a real number, you might be there when they are uncountable. That's surprising. The first glance, that second glance, maybe not. Uh, <coughs> so, but 
<laughs> of course, when you force too much, you lose you lose the sense of how the proof is actually wrong because you're just forcing everything. You're just playing with symbols. So there's a lot of holes, like the black hole. You don't know, remember Schwartz? This is Schwartz space. Uh, it's just a terrible coincidence that he had holes in his in his proof. So then people ask about these errors in the proof, uh, and he just who pulling just laughed and said that he knew about them all the whole time. So this is something that is very dangerous, right? Because if you come with a proof and you convince everybody that it's a correct proof, but it's actually like not a proof, we can just prove Riemann hypothesis. You just put like the inconsistency there, you prove a lot of theorems, you get the field metal, you get the millennium prices, you get millionaire. And then you call it the last paper being like, oh, actually this is a mistake here. So, but yeah, he just was laughing about it. The people didn't, didn't like it that much. <laughs> so, the guy was fasting. Uh, so, this is exactly what people refer if you're in a conference and somebody says, you're a poo. <coughs> <laughs> a fast one means that you might be making a lot of mistakes in the proofs or very imprecise. So, yeah, this guy, he got to jail. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think Donald Trump sued him and yeah, Donald Trump sued everyone. So then there is this uh, who Woolings calling Eh Shin. Eh Shin. <laughs> I still don't know where he's from because uh, his last name sounds uh, somewhere Asian, but he has an accent. Uh, he was able to fill these holes. Uh, how do you fill holes? You just force them. <laughs> so he just did forcing and forcing and forcing. And uh, one of the main developments was the universal shin split. Anyway, some of you that can write. So I'm going to. He went, so in attempts of to link himself to pulling and his students last law they were able to show the following result. Theorem who will you make you subshin the non collection of universal shin splits on a countable set K. If say to K denotes the associated the chain of K and F is a close family in Yushin, which disrespects CK, then the union between F and CK equals Yushin. And you disrespect <laughs> Various ways. The, the most common one is uh Use force yourself. Just the K? Yeah. And now? But, but, but maybe if you want to. It depends on. But no, once you force yourself in, that's already uh, respecting <laughs> Is there a concise way to state that it, uh, last quality there? Have you known CK equals solution? F you CK. <laughs> this was one of the, uh, it, it, they almost didn't uh, publish this one because of the suggestive notation they used. <laughs> I just give some flavor to it. I mean, you can, you can certainly say uh, the way, you know, we're, it's, it's fine. It's, I think uh, nobody's going to get mad if you say it's the F word. <laughs> Yeah. It's a family of sets. I just didn't want to say it, but now you do. Sorry. It's fine. Yeah, this is just the family of sets. Okay, proof. Uh, <laughs> let <laughs> F in your CK equals you. You might be lucky if somebody's doing that with you. And then you in your subset of. Uh, no, no, we're going to prove first that you, of course, like we're going to prove the equality by global containment. So we're going to first prove that U is containing Yushin. Let, I need to admit, like, I forgot to use the 
So like any element satisfying the relationship property as shiny. So that's how we're gonna define this element as shiny. Uh, for all shining x here, x is in f or x is in ck. That's obvious. Uh, and then for what chosen, yeah, with, with not for any k, right? You need to pick like all your k. Uh, but then the probability of you having shining almost surely is equal to 1. And this is almost surely done. <laughs> don't, don't get me in. Uh, so u is containing u shin. Now let's go vice versa. So because of the well-known fact, this is a well-known fact. It is that sex is one. <laughs> yeah, it's just there's no one. This is just one. I sometimes believe that there's a lack of this part in our department. <laughs> So f of u is bigger than f of u shin. Uh, f is uh, preserves relations of containment to order, so that we can just uh, conclude that u shin is containing u. Uh, so the porch line is that sex. So that's the only thing you need to know for this proof. Uh, so this is the result I'm just quoting again is f in c case equals u shin for some k, not for all k. For example, for c1 is not u shin all the short. So we need to, k could be anything. So u dark defined as a set of elements of universal darkness property similar to u shin. So this is again the dark, the black, the sparks, all this. Uh, theorem, uh, there was a famous mathematician. Is he French? I, I think so. I think, uh, you know, Antoine, <laughs> this is the guy that got crazy after. Yeah, he died in uh, Yeah. He died of like uh, loneliness. I think his girlfriend got him. <laughs> and because of this well known fact, if you don't have, then you're not fun, so you're not happy. And he ended up taking his life into the table. Not enjoying yourself. So, uh, the theorem just basically says that uh, for any positive integer k, uh, f minus k is disjoint from the darkness. So it has no int int the intersection between u dark and f u c k is empty. Uh, and then of course we know that the relation above f u c k, f u c k is u shin. So we have that u dark intersection. Yushin is empty because, because again, Yushin is just F union CK. Um, <coughs> we can imply from here that darkness is a place where there is not any shine or light. So we need to switch the light to avoid from darkness. We're not going to switch them because we're not going to see anything. But, uh, so, conclusion uh, we combine non constructive and constructive methods. For example, the cat in the box, showing you that's not constructive. Uh, to, extend, to extend the existence of universally dark elements. For example, hot, that's the universally dark element in the math department. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in the absolute sense, that darkness can mm, possibly, and no, cannot possibly endorse, uh, endorse any light. Unless it's but light, he endorse any light. <laughs> uh, but in the uh, strict sense of lightness, in mathematical, he cannot endorse any light. Uh, and then we describe potential scenarios where the ambient space is very, for example, any automorphism that flips the night. Right? That's why sometimes uh, he's uh, going through the hallways like two in the morning. It's dark, but he thinks it's you know, light, so he thinks he's not light. So what, what, what are potential future works? Right? Um, what about the, the elements that are uni not universal and dark? What about all of us? At the only one universally dark here is, is hot. Uh, are there better measures to describe them besides the following? The size of the universally shiny elements such that the elements are visible to them. This is a very interesting philosophical question. So this actually reflects how little we know about ourselves because we're not universally dark. Uh, how about the dynamic process of systematically darkening shining elements? 
does it necessarily change the race? We call it the definition. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't think it would change the race. Maybe you get more parts, you can get wider. Uh, but this is not really clear. This is just uh, some question I'm throwing out there for future work. Uh, thanks for the attention. I hope now everybody's comfortable about doing boxes, explosions, embeddings, cats, hot dogs, cocats. And everybody agrees that sex is fun. So it's really good. So this is, oh, I, I was going to try to guess. Yeah, uh, yeah, it was pretty easy to know that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Will Gunter did some. Number two. Do, do we get to ask questions? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, you can ask. Yep. So it's clear any time. Ask kids ask questions? Yeah, uh, so you mentioned the idea of, of actually changing race from light to dark. I, you, sh you should um, check out the works of um, Jackson at all. They're yeah, Jackson. Really interesting uh, work. The, the thing is that the only thing we can imply from Jackson's work is that for some reason the change in color has to do with losing your nose. So if you change too much, then your nose starts falling down. So, but um, I don't think he changed his race. Did, wait, did he just have Schrodinger's nose? He what? Did he just have Schrodinger's nose? I don't know. But this is the this is the do you think he changed his his, his race? That's what you're asking, right? Um, it's just it's just an interesting word to check out. I mean, perhaps losing his nose would be really at the end of it. Or we're talking about cane, cocaine, you know, embarrassed. <laughs> that that actually that, that's actually gonna lose your septum, not the full nose. Maybe, maybe if you change color and you do the co map, then you're gonna change race. <laughs> so that means the co race is changed. The co race is. So that means that your co race is different from your race. I I've heard about some research in uh, the area of decathlons in which they change race <laughs> several times. <laughs> they do. They do. They do. Uh, I think I don't know, but they, they do change the races. But I don't know if um if you change your race. And you get the skin, you know, like, and you change your your color as well, your darkness or your lightness. Uh, are you gonna improve in the positioning of the decathlon at the end, like in the points? That might be. That's very interesting. You talk. Uh, could you? This is actually a two-part question. Yeah. Uh, the pseudo letter. What was it again? <laughs> um, now, how, how would that be used? Could you perhaps demonstrate how that would be used in the context of butts hex? <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm going to leave it to the imagination, but it's very self explanatory. Right? So it's an exercise left for the reader at this point? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I don't know if it's your reader, if you're reading or you're listening, but yeah. I think the mom actually had a really good <laughs> 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 Okay, so what, what was the second part of the question? Oh no, that, that, that was both parts. I wanted to. Yeah. Yeah, the only thing is that you need to remember how to, you know, like, because if you say I or scream something like I or Iota, then nobody's going to understand you. You actually have to do the face it. <laughs> yeah, actually, like, the, the, the interesting part is when you have like an exclamation mark at the end, then it's really, it's really hard. I can't, I can't have it mastered, but it's something like. <laughs> so, so that you can see post explosion. That's right before. That's at the time, and then it collapses. <laughs> That's the only thing. Uh, any other questions? I, I, I do have a question. Um, so, can we conclude that cat dogs? Are an injective um, element in the category? Any further work is needed. Yeah, there's no fear. Okay. Well, uh, anyways, if you want to see if there's a scary monster or a creepy monster, you just close that one. That's okay. <laughs> there. Are these number?